This is a Manipal Hospitals podcast. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of White Coat World. I'm your presenter Vasanthi Hari Prakash and our topic for the day is management of lung cancer where we touch upon diagnostics, types of lung cancer, staging, treatment options, clinical trials, complementary medicine and so much more. Do not let these topics intimidate you because our guests today do the mighty job of simplifying complex jargon to simple things that we can digest. So let's kick start today's session, shall we? Hi, welcome to a brand new episode of White Coat World by Manipal Hospitals. A podcast show by the doctors and for the doctors. I'm Dr. Piyush Bajpai. I'm heading the Department of Medical Oncology at Manipal Hospital Delhi. And I'm Dr. Shubham Jain. I'm head of the department and consultant surgical oncology at Manipal Hospitals Delhi. Today we will be discussing on lung cancer. Uh, what all advances have happened over the past decade? And it's really after 2010, lung cancer treatment has seen uh, leaps and bounds, uh, advances in leaps and bounds. And so this is important that uh, we talk about this disease pattern, especially uh, just now uh, on 9th of March was no smoking day. And we understand that uh, lung cancer primarily is linked to tobacco consumption. It is definitely on the rise. India is facing around 13 lakh cases of uh, cancer every year. So, uh, Dr. Shubham, with yeah. this sort of lung cancer burden that India is facing, uh, with such a high mortality, and most of our patients, uh, we, they present in uh, advanced stage lung cancer. What, what is your uh, viewpoint on cancer screening, lung cancer screening specifically uh, in this particular disease pattern? So a very valid question and a very important one, Dr. Piyush. Lung cancer screening has an established role in the West. Uh, both in Americas and the Europe, there have been randomized trials which have shown the benefit of screening in early detection of lung cancer and their overall survival improvement for these patients. Uh, unfortunately, in a resource-constrained country like ours, it has not yet become the main scale uh, public health policy. But I strongly believe that all the heavy smokers or all at-risk people should opt for an annual low-dose CT scan which can help us detect these cancers early enough uh, to be able to offer an optimal treatment which can actually change the way uh, the disease uh, behaves for Indians as of now. Uh, it is important for our uh, colleagues to understand that these are offered, this low-dose CT scan is offered to people who are heavy smokers uh, mostly in the ages of 50 to 70 years, uh, either current or just recently who've st stopped smoking. And it's a painless, non-invasive test. It's just a CT scan that needs to be done once a year, which will help us detect any lesion. And then it can trigger a chain of uh, tests that can help us detect the cancer early. The challenges that uh, our colleagues face, uh, and rightly so, are the high false positive rate which means uh, that there is a chance that something innocuous is picked up on the CT scan, which needs to get investigated. The Western world is also uh, trying to cope up with this. Uh, the more uh, refined way we select our uh, population who is undergoing the test, so it has to be high, uh, heavy smokers, a proper age, the lesser the chances of a false positive. But nevertheless, I would still stress on the fact that people should identify, our colleagues should identify people who are at high risk of developing such lung cancer and they should recommend a low-dose CT scan for these patients. I absolutely agree. I think so. With the sort of uh, uh, advanced stage can lung cancers that we end up seeing, I think so high time that we, the, the concept of screening uh, should be spread amongst the physicians because this is actually reducing the mortality as well. I agree. So, uh, what do you think is the role of the biopsy and what exactly is this liquid biopsy that we often heard hear about? Okay, so you pointed out a very right and a very uh, important point that you brought out and that is uh, biopsy in lung cancer. So, biopsy as you just mentioned that uh, sometimes with the sort of, uh, you know, cases that we see, uh, there could be tuberculosis mimicking uh, lung cancer. So many times we have seen patients who have been treated for tuberculosis and then eventually we realize that this 
a lesion is not responding on x-ray and then uh, the biopsy is done sometimes we get to see that uh, reports of fnacs are there and so what is now being realized that a good core biopsy is very important a uh, tissue is an issue in lung cancer actually and so uh, because of the molecular diagnostics with what we as medical oncologists uh, do after getting the small bit of tissue that is so important because you can actually analyze the dna and realize which medicine you need to give to treat the patient better so it is going to guide in precision medicine now unfortunately sometimes we do not get those type of uh, tissues what uh, i just mentioned uh, because sometimes the background lung is diseased like uh, as you know copd or emphysema could be the background lung and sometimes uh, pneumothorax could be a real problem if if we enter the lung through a ct guided route and uh, in my personal uh, experience and also uh, uh, what we see is that peripheral lung cancers are actually difficult to approach by the central methods like the bronchoscopy but uh, the ct guided biopsies really help but sometimes this all is uh, very difficult and therefore uh, the other way what you just uh, alluded to was liquid biopsy and liquid biopsy is one way where the dna of the tumor spills in the blood stream and we are uh, we we then uh, study this uh, circulating free dna the circulating dna and analyze that what sort of tumor it is whether it can be treated with with which tablet so this is studying the dna which is there in the blood stream so having said that uh, dr shubham after establishing the lung biopsy after knowing that it's cancer and uh, nearly 30% of the cases 20 to 30% we do get to see some early stages as well how would you stage a patient uh, in your you know practice uh, before surgery so dr piyush staging is and you would agree one of the most important uh, markers of how the patient is going to uh, progress in his natural history and what the treatment options are so there is no replacement for a good staging before planning the treatment now uh, conventionally for any cancer the uh, nodal assessment and a metastatic disease evaluation both are very important uh, more so for lung cancers because we have seen in the past that the occult spread to either bones or brain uh, is so often placed uh, in our patients that there is no way that this metastatic workup should be avoided in any patient unless and until it's a very rare case of a very early disease so because of that reason the metastatic evaluation uh, should include a pet ct scan and an mri brain Uh, there have been many instances where the patient otherwise seemed to be fine but uh, we picked up an incidental lesion on mri of the brain and these uh, the stage changed remarkably for the patient and the disease outcomes so uh, really there is no shortcut i feel for the uh, metastatic workup uh, similarly for the mediastinal staging or this uh, to identify spread of cancer to the lymph nodes in the chest uh, there are various modalities uh, pet ct for one does give us some idea of uh, whether the nodes are involved or not but uh, for majority of the tumors we would need a uh, ebus fnac which is basically an endobronchial ultrasound guided fnac wherein a scope is inserted into the airway and the pulmonologist helps us in identifying any enlarged nodes and a sample is taken which the pathologist then uh, tells us whether it's involved or not but uh, the chances of ebus coming uh, giving a false report is also reasonably high so when the clinical suspicion is good or uh, if we are planning for a surgical resection of any lung cancer i do prefer in going for a mediastinoscopy which basically is insertion of a uh, scope into the chest through a small incision in the neck to evaluate the nodes uh, at large uh we are able to uh, draw bigger samples of these nodes and the pathologist is then able to comment more confidently whether these nodes are involved or not uh you would agree to me that the management of the disease with uh, the knowledge that it has spread to the lymph nodes in the chest uh differs drastically and uh, changes a lot so uh that's my view on this what do you think about the metastatic workup and the staging 
Well, I agree with you that uh, the surgical workup should include all the thorough mediastinal staging ones. So you are seeing a, a chest limited or a mediastinal uh, limited disease patterns. And uh, you are absolutely right that uh, the management should change. Man- management could change uh, if there is a, you know, a high nodal burden, uh, especially the N2 and the N3. So there are definitely different ramifications. And of course, when uh, uh, most of the times uh, w- when we see on a thoracic CT or a chest X-ray, a uh, lung limited disease, uh, PET CT has really gained the ground as you just mentioned that uh, PET CT is now being done. And it really helps uh, not only uh, in the metastatic disease workup and if my radiation colleague would have been there, he would have definitely agreed that uh, the, the feel of radiation definitely uh, gets uh, affected by the PET scan and a thorough mediastinal staging. So that, of course, metastatic workup, definitely the PET CT helps over there. And of course, the local staging, again, the PET CT helps over there as well. Uh, likewise, for the brain, MRI has uh, gained importance, especially in in early stage, as well as now in advanced stage uh, lung cancer as well. Because any local therapy you go for, you must have a MRI brain done because of high propensity of these lung cancers, especially the adenocarcinomas, small cell carcinomas to go into the brain. So definitely a baseline MRI of the brain is very uh, important because PET-CT does not throw much of light on the uh, small lesions in the brain. Therefore, MRI needs to be done before we start treatment. Uh, Now, as we are talking about treatment, uh, so, Dr. Shubham, what are the advances? What have happened uh, uh, over the past uh, few years? Uh, what are your comments on the minimal invasive procedures that are happening? Well, that's the most important, exciting part for a surgeon in the management of lung cancers that you've now come to. Uh, lung cancer treatment has seen a paradigm shift in the last decade or so. Uh, the minimally invasive surgery with the help of laparoscope, which is called a VATS, or the robotic platform, which is called a RATS, has actually now come into the mainstream. And uh, it's very well acceptable. We are able to good, give good results to the patients, especially with the improvement in the uh, ancillary surgical techniques, that is the staplers, the improvement in the critical care. And these actually help us in uh, uh, delivering the same oncological safety to the patient, which, which is removing the lobe that is affected by the uh, disease. And in turn, it has also improved our short-term outcomes. The patients are able to go home faster. Uh, They have shorter scars. They have lesser pain because of chest surgery. It has overall reduced the morbidity a lot. So uh, that has been a game changer in the management of uh, lung cancer surgically. Also, another important advance is the uh, acceptability of segmentectomy for lung uh, screening detected lesions. So when the lesion that is detected is too small, uh, the old concept of doing a lobectomy is now being challenged by the surgeons, wherein a smaller uh, smaller segment of the uh, lobe that is taken out is being debated as being oncologically equivalent to a lobectomy. There are more randomized data trials that are still awaited, but in the times to come, it is likely to change that the lobectomy uh, that is a standard of care right now may shrink further to a segmentectomy. Having said that, uh, how do you prefer to manage the patients in the adjuvant period after the surgery f- uh, for lung cancers? Uh, please share us your insights into how that has changed and evolved. Definitely that uh, area of uh, adjuvant treatment uh, for lung cancer, chemotherapy did come up, uh, you know, and there was meta-analysis to prove that after you have done the surgery, the the surgeon has done uh, their job, then uh, chemotherapy was being discussed in stage 1B and above stages uh, up to stage 3. So there, chemotherapy definitely had established its role with various old trials and meta-analysis showing that there is an incremental almost 5% benefit uh, absolute benefit if uh, chemotherapy is given a, in an adjuvant setting, uh, additionally to surgery. So uh, adjuvant chemotherapy was there for a very long time. And now what we are seeing is that uh, the, now with the targeted drugs being available. So if we are doing this particular mutation earlier uh, on the sample that uh, the, the surgeon gives us, uh, the, the pathologist, uh, you know, after uh, proving that it's a uh, adenocarcinoma or a, uh, 
squamous cell carcinoma. So we can then accordingly, most of the times in adenocarcinoma, uh, send this sample for mutation testing. And EGFR is one particular mutation where now the drug is established in, uh, in the adjuvant setting as well and giving some great results. So uh, ozimertinib is the drug which is actually showing in uh, data in adjuvant setting and uh, is impacting hugely on the survival also. Likewise, uh, now there is a thought process before you operate, uh, Dr. Shubham, uh, there is now this concept coming of neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy and neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy rather. So uh, there is this uh, Keynote 816 trial uh, which recently got approved uh, for the drug combination through the FDA that, uh, you know, you use uh, nivolumab and chemotherapy together, you are actually getting some great pathological complete responses as in the, there is a lot of necrosis, necrosis happening, cell death happening before uh, the surgery. And uh, then the surgeons are finding it easier to reject the, uh, it is more of a less blood spill and post-op recovery is better. Likewise, uh, the responses are so good. Sometimes we are able to predict how would the patient do when we have some uh, good uh, pathological complete responses. So this is a very exciting field which is coming up, new adjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. Yeah. So, uh, but as we just discussed that it is metastatic primarily, but there is now a window of small metastasis happening and that is oligometastasis. What are your comments on management of oligometastatic disease? So oligometastatic is an entity that is actually a creation of our medical advances. Uh, many a times, as I was saying, uh, because of the advancements in diagnostic uh, techniques, we are able to detect patients who are not full-blown metastatic with a widespread disease and we have detected a uh, few restricted lesions. So it may be in the brain, it may be in the adrenal. Now, what the trials and the data has shown is that if we are uh, treating these patients with a curative intent, that is, we remove the metastatic lesion as well as the primary lesion, uh, these patients have benefited and behaved much more like a, a primary uh, lesion which is localized or at least loco-regional uh, rather than behaving as a fully metastatic disease. So that is the benefit. Uh, obviously, it comes with its own caveats that the patient's mediastinal notes should be negative, uh, wherein these patients before uh, being offered treatment with a curative intent, a mediastinoscopy is done. Uh, we also should be able to tackle with these metastatic sites uh, with curative intent. We should be able to get, get an R0 over there, uh, whether it's the adrenal gland or the brain. And only then do we offer these patients the surgery for the uh, lung primary. But uh, we do come across such patients uh, many a times who are just on the verge of uh, getting a full-blown metastatic disease and there was just a one or two restricted sites. So if these patients are uh, fit, I definitely see a point in treating them with a the curative intent rather than what used to be the norm previously of labeling them as a metastatic disease and just giving up on them. Uh, having said that, even the locally advanced uh, lung cancers that we see, uh, that's an evolving area. And what are your thoughts on the immunotherapy that goes on for these locally advanced diseases? Yeah, so locally advanced lung cancer again, and uh, there is there has been uh, primarily the role of chemo radiation in patients who were unrejectable stage three B, uh, especially specifically. So their uh, post chemo radiation, uh, there was a dilemma that uh, eventually we were actually waiting for the patient to relapse. There was the relapse free survival was actually, you know, almost one and a half years. Uh, but now there is immunotherapy coming into play. And uh, this particular immunotherapy, Darvalumab, actually has, uh, you know, rekindled hope of a better uh, treatment outcome. So definitely it is increasing uh, the survival by almost another uh, 12 months, uh, rather rather slightly more. So uh, definitely in adjuvant setting, uh, post chemo radiation, uh, darvalumab if given for one year is uh, now a hope for these patients. Uh, having said the locally advanced, and I, I uh, do understand locally advanced is one particular complex uh, disease pattern. What are your uh, thoughts on uh, some very complex surgeries involved in uh, these locally advanced tumors. 
so locally advanced lung cancer can be both challenging and at the same time complex uh, surgical options for the patient uh, we call this disease locally advanced primarily whether it's involving the airway a more central airway or uh, supposedly if it's involving the chest wall or the muscles of the respiration so these are cases wherein uh, it's just there we can remove these organs and safely uh but obviously the thought is of how the setup is going to be and how the patient is going to behave so choosing your patients uh, who are fit enough to uh, undergo such procedures is the most important thing uh, there are peripheral uh, centers across our country which will not be able to offer such complex surgeries and these patients then go for a chemo radiation but uh, at a center like ours the comprehensive cancer center uh there are facilities with the help of other departments like the critical care the blood medicine uh, and everything with the cooperation of all these we can uh, offer the patients a surgical cure and obviously the surgical cure is the best option for the patient in any solid organ cancer so uh, that's it and uh, r- removing the airway and doing sleeve resections is feasible at times it is feasible uh, through a vats or a rats approach also and uh, obviously adding the uh, adjuvant chemo radiation for such patients would still be the norm but the outcomes definitely improve much more rather than just uh, giving these patients a definitive chemo radiation do you agree to that dr piyush oh yeah, absolutely i mean the wherever the window of opportunity of doing a local resection or any local therapy definitely one should uh, have a tumor board meeting a comprehensive multidisciplinary uh inputs should be taken for each patient of lung cancer i think so uh, the patient would hugely benefit uh with these sort of inputs i absolutely agree with you on that okay and that's what we, and- we do agree over here but sometimes we do differ in tumor boards so that's absolutely fine so it's always in the best interest of the patient and these once you put our you know these are uh, different opinions we gain more inputs and we we actually debate through for each patient yeah absolutely and uh, speaking of advanced cancers coming back to metastatic uh, lung cancers the uh, 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 scenario has evolved and uh, evolved drastically can you please share your thoughts and insights into how it has changed over the last few years and how you see it evolving in the coming years so what i remember is that you know going back some uh, uh, 14 years back when we were doing our i was doing my dm course uh, at that time there was this particular drug gefitinib which was being discussed uh, you know uh, tony mock paper uh, where this particular drug was used in a su- specific subset of population on clinical characteristic it was female adenocarcinoma non smokers or relatively lighter smokers asian and these patients were actually doing great on uh, this particular drug gefitinib they they were doing better than what conventional chemotherapy was so somewhere there was this realization that something would be peculiar for these patients and eventually thanks to precision medicine thanks to analysis of uh, dna uh, mutations by various platform like next generation sequencing it became u- hugely po- possible to detect such mutations and this was realized that egfr mutation which is definitely one of the biggest chunk of uh, mutations in lung cancer uh, this is druggable and there are uh, most of the times the 90% or 80 90% of mutations uh, found in, in this particular domain uh, of tyrosine kinase is basically druggable and uh, gefitinib was the uh, first generation or lorlotinib was the first generation and now we are talking about the third generation uh, egfr blockade and that's osimertinib and now what's the difference between the generation is that there is better brain penetration and there is more uh, evid Uh, binding to the receptor more specific binding to the receptor so this has definitely increased uh, you know the cell kill the apoptosis and also we, it is uh, uh, th- this is realizing now into better survivals so uh, definitely precision medicine has brought in this and then the realization that it's almost 50% of the more than slightly more than 50% are Uh, mutations in lung cancer where you need not give chemotherapy and you can keep chemotherapy as a reserve so there are alk inhibitors and now there are braf inhibitors and then uh, you name uh, a receptor and now there is some clinical trial going all over the world uh, for these uh, 
oral tablets actually and they are doing much much better than chemotherapy also then there was this uh, realization uh, that immunotherapy is something that is a programmed death ligand binding uh, agent and this immunotherapy is actually activating our immune responses against cancer which is, uh, which the cancer actually nullifies uh, our our immune system in terms of uh, inhibiting our immune system uh, this immunotherapy uh, drug like uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab they are actually uplifting that uh, immune system and uh, making our body capable enough to fight against cancer so uh, what we are seeing is patients are doing much better we are able to give this in elderly sometimes weak individuals where we had you know to think twice whether we will be really able to deliver chemotherapy so definitely this is a real game changer having spoken about these recent advances what is your uh, take on palliative medicine dr shivam so uh the harsh reality dr pius still is that majority of our patients do present in metastatic stage and unfortunately in a country like us majority of our patients still are not able to either afford the medicines the recent advances uh, that you were talking about or uh, they don't have access to the healthcare facilities uh, such as complex surgical resections or these uh, options of surgery or early detection so that is why in the management of lung cancer palliative medicine or end of life care still hold a very central role uh, patients who are detected and diagnosed at advanced stages of cancer do need to be uh, discussed in a multidisciplinary tumor board such as ours and a palliative specialist who can address at least the basic issues for such patients such as pain feeding uh, these should be addressed and there is absolutely no uh, second thought on this uh, that it is a very important component of any uh, lung cancer management or lung cancer program that any hospital has uh with this i think we'd like to close the session uh it was wonderful talking to you dr piyush uh thank you so much uh, we hope uh, you'll be uh, watching the next white coat world episode thank you and bye till then